Thank you, everybody. It's an honor to uh, be here and to introduce some work. Mm, maybe uh, it's uh, some PhD uh, research work uh, to everybody here. And uh, uh, in a, in a uh, co Congress, the book and the name is just the legacy effects of herbivore trampling on uh, so I open the carbon, but I I want to uh, show you about not only the legacy and the current maybe immediately effects of trampling, um, uh, so we can compare them and to know more about the legacy effects. And uh, my name is Lan Li, and I was a postdoc in Lanzhou University, the southeast uh, west of the China. And uh, I will uh, uh, introduce my work from the seven parts. Firstly, background, and um, as we all know, the grazing is the most intensive uh, the land use activities, maybe counting for 50% 50, uh, 50 of the land surface. And um, maybe, uh, and uh, herbivores are also important to some uh, ecosystems, biogeochemistries, uh, including uh, soil, nitrogen dynamics, and the distribution, and uh, plant communities, and uh, so, uh, soil carbon pools. Now, there are also, uh, there exists the classic concept, the herbivore impact soils through the tropic interaction. Maybe uh, we all know uh, herbivore will increase the uh, uh, carbon pools uh, in the uh, maybe in poor nitrogen systems, such as um, uh, many desert step and uh, some uh, shrub, shrub step and, and decrease so, uh, carbon stocks in highly, um, highly nitrogen systems, such as many uh, maybe alpine meadows and some uh, tem um, temperature typical grassland. Uh, and maybe because of these two ways, uh, one is the um, tropical response to the uh, uh, herbivore at the plant community levels, such as you know the foreign, uh, uh, the grazing animals uh, selective feedings, and they um, uh, they choose the best the uh, best grass and left the uh, the worst grass. So the maybe carbon carbon to nitrogen ratios uh, may be higher and then it increase the uh, ca uh, soil carbon pools. And another way is accelerating the decomposition's uh, because they, uh, they, trip, they trampoline plants into the soil and bury them to and, uh, uh, some down and urine uh, depositions. And now, but uh, they are growing, uh, growing interest in the uh, no tropical interactions. Just like because herbivores ha have other uh, behaviors like trampling and uh, browsing and uh, digging, maybe they uh, they are play with each others and uh, and uh, they also have some um, some effects on the grassland. Uh, the the most um, important uh, effects is uh, the soil compactions uh, inc uh, induced by the trampoline. They think um, they think this is the mainly mainly the um, driving force of the changes of soils in some management systems, and there are frame uh, are some frameworks for the uh, how the uh, trampoline affects the. Uh, soil and the uh, soil carbon uh, dynamics, uh, maybe uh, through the compassion and uh, 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 maybe uh, influence soil bacteria, fungi, and uh, change the plant cover and uh, community structures. And now, some mm, some people and the re, uh, nearly uh, research ha has also focused on the legacy effects of the tr the grazing. Maybe in the um, maybe uh, before the the Richard Bucket also uh, um, prepared that paper pa uh, paper about that when the stop 
uh, grazing or grazing exposure, uh, many soil bacteria and the fungi decreased. And, uh, and, but I also had, uh, had found some, uh, some mm, phenomena in China. If we stop grazing, um, the, the, mm, or re remove the grazers, the ecosystem will turn uh, will not be too bad or help you get more um, functionalities. And uh, the, the next effects, maybe uh, if you stop the, uh, up, um, the, the, the treatments or something, disturbance, and uh, uh, the e uh, ecosystem states and the service functional uh, function will, st will um, until and continue uh, to persistent uh, persistent and uh, also some research has found that grazing legacy have um, have uh, alert uh, carbon nitrogen cyclings and some uh, properties and I want to sh uh, show that grazing legacy not only the um, the, the time um, time like effects because also uh, many people are focused on the time lag effects of grazing um, because they have a uh, three free, uh, uh, three stage when stop grazing they have a pre recovery stage and then uh, they uh, they came into a recovery stage and uh, uh, maybe until um, one years two years uh, to for a long time uh, the, uh, uh, the ecosystem's um, status will be uh, have a post recovery stage, and uh, it, uh, it could be uh, recovered for the, to the baseline or uh, did not come back. And um, mm, uh, I, I said mm, some people ignore the ignore the. Mm, spiritual uh, s scale because uh, eco uh, eco grazing legacy is not only the time lag, it's just the time and the spiritual uh, maybe interactions and the grazing is maybe uh, down and uh, urine depositions and trampling and foraging, they occurred um, uh, interactionally and uh, uh, it can in, uh, influence the ecosystem from sp spaces uh, to maybe to the um, animals or uh, a large uh, scales, maybe to a system, ecosystem scales. So I want to uh, know uh, why and how uh, the grazing legacy effects on the soil carbon pore. But uh, mm, but uh, many uh, maybe some research has given some reasons or some mm, results, uh, and I want to know how the trampling uh, affects the soil vegetation characters because. Uh, and as we all know, the animals uh, maybe uh, often maybe no uh, uh, ex uh, uh, urine or then deposition maybe not uh, foraging, but they trample all the time. And uh, I, I want to know not only the current and the legacy effects uh, in our area. And um, whether the po and uh, what's the result, positive or negative, or um, they only uh, mainly through the uh, maybe the soil compaction way or the plant community changes. And this is my start area is uh, in Huanxian Grassland Ag Agriculture Trail Station of Lanzhou University, maybe uh, at the Lois Plateau uh, in Gansu Province and northwest of the China. And uh, this location is um, is uh, are have included more uh, many uh, farming pastoral ecosystem uh, cropping and uh, agroforestry and silver pastures. And uh, the climate uh, condi uh, condition here is a typical conditional motion climate. And the uh, main annual rainfall with me 266 and um, mainly occurred in the growing seasons and um, uh, mainly annual temperature is 8.4. Our grassland type is a typical 
uh, temperature step and the soil set step is uh, maybe loyal, low so so also with some sand textures and the dominant species are the uh, Artemisia capleza and the Lepidiza divatria and the Stipa vagina. And uh, mm, start from the 2001, we ex ex experiment. Uh, establish the um, rot uh, township rotational grazing system. We have uh, tw 12 um, paddocks, maybe four stocking rate, and uh, the ro rotational grazing is um, maybe uh, um, maybe grazed 20 days and then have a rest um, um, until 10 days, and I will have uh, three rotational circles. And the uh, township we bought um, every year with the same weight, and uh, uh, we sold out uh, in the uh, winter. And then I want to, uh, because we, we could not um, uh, separate the sheep trampling from the grazing behavior, so uh, we must uh, simulate sh sheep grazing. And uh, I have the experiment design uh, become the 90, uh, 20, uh, 70 and 20, uh, 20, uh, 2016, we established uh, 24 pots and two the and to, it's include about uh, four uh, trampling intensity. How to, uh, how to, and why we uh, set this trampling intensity? Because we uh, have this um, rotational systems, so have, we have four stocking rates, and uh, we're watching the grazing behavior, and to uh, find their trampling intensity is, uh, is, is 40, 80, and 120 foot steps uh, 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 meter. Uh, quarter meters, and uh, then we want to simulate simulate the uh, trampling, and we made a uh, artificial hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, um, I didn't show the picture because uh, the, um, because I changed the computer and the uh, the picture may be lost. And I I want to describe the the artificial hope they said so similar like the the shape, uh, ship's hook uh, hope and uh, the the pressure intensity of the hook maybe uh, maybe uh, is, is equal to the uh, the three uh, thirty five kilogram of the uh, sheep. And uh, um, uh, we is, uh, trampoline, uh, we simulate trampolines uh, as uh, the, the, the data is uh, equal to the period of the rotational grazing experiment. And uh, uh, we, st we want to know the legacy of the trampoline. So we stopped the tramp uh, trampoline uh, in 2017 and uh, we measure the, the legacy effect in 2019, and we will see the difference between the pictures uh, after the recovery of the trampoline, the, the, the grass and baby recovery. And I also manage some mm, some vegetation properties and the soil properties. And uh, quite cool. And uh, we uh, want to know. Uh, and to quantify the uh, tr um, trampoline legacy, so I I made a, maybe made a, a calculations to uh, to to let us know why uh, and how, uh, how and what the trampoline legacy is, um, and uh, I used uh, the uh, statistics analysis in this research. And the research is uh, uh, when the 2070, when we uh, simulated the trampoline, the, um, uh, the not uh, in, uh, not surprised the uh, soil bank density increase and the soil available nitrogen will be uh, will decrease uh, what decrease and the soil available phosphorus decrease. Mm, but uh, the soil uh, organic carbon uh, increased, maybe because the soil bank density, you know. And uh, um, but after two years, we stopped simulate the trampoline. The um, the soil available nitrogen that the first increased and recovered. And uh, uh, 
uh, when we uh, and the trampling if uh, 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 its intensity is increased, uh, the the plant community composition or uh, diversity not changed too much. Uh, also have a decreased trend, but it's uh, not uh, maybe maybe changed as the soil properties. And uh, after we stop the trampling, and uh, maybe the the light trampling intensity increased the uh, above ground of the biomass, and but the. Uh, um, when we when the uh, intensity higher than that, it decreased, and um, some other uh, diversities maybe increased also, but the richness did not change. Okay, yes, and the uh, the plant func uh, functional traits is also similar to the uh, diversities when the recovery of the trampling it increased. And uh, we want to know what's uh, uh, how and mechanism under the soil of, uh, organic carbon in response to the trampling. Uh, we found the uh, maybe the uh, um, the uh, plant uh, variables and the soil bunk, bunk density is a main drivers. So we build a, a structure structure equation uh, models and to find what's the uh, main drivers and I thought the uh, maybe uh, when the trampling exists uh, the soil bank density is a main driver but uh, we quit that the uh, maybe the maybe uh, below ground biomass and uh, functional rich, richness and soil uh, available nitrogen was become the main uh, drivers, and uh, I have the main uh, conclusion about that um, trampling has a strong uh, temporary and legacy effects on soil carbon and uh, has significant inco increase. Uh, it many will change the in soil bank densities, and when concession of uh, uh, trampling for two years, trampling had also a positive effects, and uh, maybe it will uh, alterations in soil available phosphorus functionality diversity and. Uh, um, soil properties, and the um, and I thought. Uh, or maybe also a mystic uh, uh, stocking rate of 2.7 ship per, per hectare uh, was equal to the 44 step uh, um, milligram is uh, most suitable for grassing adaptation management. And also this research has some limitations because the simulating trampoline, you know, is not really the grazers uh, grazers mm, real behavior. So it many mm, not mm, not mm, not to uh, make make our uh, uh, make our to know more uh, clearly about the grading and uh, our results also mm, give us some implications about that when we when we grazing for a time or maintain a high grazing we need to mm, have a recovery years maybe uh, and to recover uh, the soil process, so the seasonal grazing or um, or some others may be uh, good for the grassland. And uh, I will thanks to my supervisors Fu Zhanghou and my other uh, teachers Xiong Zhaohe and some students maybe uh, help me to uh, finish the experiment and uh, Landry University and my foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lan. We, we don't have uh, time for questions. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Yafi Shi. Is he or she here? No. P part of the reason I didn't rush the first speaker is that I was pretty sure the second speaker wasn't here. <laughs> so um, we will start. Uh, so we, we're supposed to keep in time with the other um, sessions. So the next one, I'll, I'll just start the next one a little bit earlier in, a, in about uh, three minutes at 10.40 rather than 10.45. Uh, we do have the next speaker uh, here 
It's uh, Guillermo Labata, who's uh, going to speak to us on the impact of the brachyurea hybrids on both soil health and carbon stock on livestock production. So, Guillermo, over to you if you can load your presentation. And I'll give you just uh, three minutes warning when I'm about to boot you off. Okay? Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> Definitely all needed. <laughs> So good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, John. My name is Guilherme Lobato. I'm from Brazil. I'm very humble and honored to represent uh, our team and different entities in our exploratory analysis and, and research on the impact of brachyaria hybrids on both soil health and carbon stock on livestock production. A background from our research uh, on the last 30 years, especially, 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 specifically, uh, agriculture has evolved dramatically, uh, specifically in whole crops like corn and maize. According to world data, since 1961, uh, crops like corn and maize have increased the area in about 150%, and, but the production increased 1,200%. When we compare agriculture and whole crops with grazing, grazing systems, we see that there's a lot of opportunity to increase the pace of adoption of new technologies and management practices that occur in agriculture. One of those is intensification of tropical grasslands. It might be a good opportunity for grazing systems to involve and go to another step. Analyzing the the opportunity worldwide, we can see the pastures occupy 30% of total worth uh, in total worth lands. And when we put in a funnel and analyze Brazil, where our, our analysis was made, we can see that the brachiaras occupy 80% of total pasture cultivated in Brazil. As we go deeper and we analyze brachiaria in Brazil, we can see that more than 50% of brachiaria usage in Brazil is adopted by only, only one genotype in Brazil. So we analyze here brachyaria hybrids as a potential uh, tool and management practice to increase technology for livestock. As we can see, we analyze that this strategy was very important for land utilization and also a tool and management practice to minimize environmental practices. So the adoption of, the, the hypothesis here is to the adoption of brachyaria hybrids might also help farmers to produce economic, uh, environmentally friendly manner and also increase their production and also in a sustainable manner. Our goal here and our objective on this work is to analyze the impact of brachyaria hybrids in the soil health and also in carbon stock, livestock production. The materials and methods that you used, this experiment was established in 2018 in Sao Paulo State in Brazil. Uh, in that side of the, the, the shot, you guys, uh, you can see. And we analyzed six brachyara hybrids. So this is a combination of three, uh, uh, so three sources and three uh, combination of brachyaras that provide this technology and hybridization of brachyara. So we tested six hybrids in three replications and, and using different 20 centimeters of, uh, between lines, eight seeds per, per middle linear and a density of 400,000 seeds for, for each cultivated hectare. Analyzing soil sample, uh, as we can see, we analyzed, we did chemical, physical, and biological analysis uh, and all the replicants. We analyze also 
four enzyme cycles, analyzing sulfur, carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen, and also the carbon concentration from zero to 19 centimeters uh, using combustion, combustion method. From a statistical analysis, we use two-way ANOVA to analyze the difference between mean carbon stock along the soil depth and also the plant genotypes, and also one-way ANOVA to assess the significant difference between the mean enzyme activity and the genotypes. Here's some pictures from our team in Brazil working on this project to illustrate a few part of the work. And as a result, as this chart can see in this, in this map with different colors, we can see in the bottom that the six different hy uh, hybrids of Brachiara, the six different genoty genotypes, and it's clear that we can see a difference on carbon stock between the genotypes and also the soil, be the, the soil depth. As, as you can see here, each genotypes interact differently and the carbon stock was different in different uh, layers of the soil depth. When we cross this information, analyzing the soil depth, the genotypes, and also carbon stock, analyzing ANOVA, we can see the genotypes 3660, 40, 1435, and 3025, dem they demonstrate uh, enhancing carbon in different and specific levels uh, in the top layer, and also in the bottom layer and the different ones hybrids. Mean carbon uh, vary across the dimp in the genotype as you can see here in the ANOVA again. And the genotypes 1467 and 3025, they, they provide deeper soil layers performance while 36 provides significant carbon accumulation in the top layer of zero to 10 uh, carbon stock in the soil. The same chart here, but we summarize the, the total carbon stock for each hybrid of Brachiara, and we can see the performance in, in the different hybrids, and also the potential of this technology, and also the usage of this in different layers, providing uh, an interesting tool for farmers managing prod productively, and also what they are looking for environmental impact in their, in their production. Although Brachiara genotypes they doesn't, they, they do not exhibit no significant difference in the mean enzyme, we saw an opportunity in this project to analyze in different uh, way enzymes in different stages in the future projects, and also beta-glucosidase activity is not lower in, it's lower in, in the genotype 3660, when we compare to another genotypes. So a few conclusions from our research. So the select Brachiara genotypes, they display significant differences between in, in the carbon stock across varying soil depths. We saw the difference between the genotypes results in the, the, the layer of zero to 10 and also layers from 40 to 60 centimeters. We also see that genotype could be chosen according to the specific target of the farmers in the further farmer land. So we saw opportunity not only for production, palatility, and, and you can see when we anal analyze carbon stock, there's a huge opportunity for hybrids that provide a better result in the, in the, in the layers of zero to 10 in other layers, in other genotypes that provide better result in deep, in depth layers. Brachiara genotypes doesn't, doesn't show uh, significant differences in enzyme activities, uh, but also we saw an opportunity that in the future projects to analyze enzymes in different stages of Brachiara, and this could be a signal or a biosensor for analyze other interactions between plants and soil. Uh, okay. Uh, Analyzing potential next steps for this project, we can see and we are looking for the future to an analyze not only carbon accumulation, but associate those factors as palatility, productivity, and also conversion of biomass 
investigating the balance in the impact of carbon storage alongside other factors. So this is how can we uh, provide new technology for growers and also they have an opportunity to combine new hybrids, new technologies with their goals for productivity. The another potential next step that we analyze as an opportunity in this project is to see, make a sequence of microbiota and analyze the, compo the compositone and the function of the microbiota for each genotype and also understand each role for the plant role and how those genotypes deliver these important uh, uh, results for soil and biodiversity. Also as an opportunity, the variations in carbon st uh, stock and also when we analyze beta glucosidase activity could be also uh, an opportunity to understand this mechanism and also associate carbon stocks and this enzyme, enzyme activity act between the different genotypes. So analyzing the, the enzyme activity as a biosensor and a potential uh, information to predict and also to help and support companies to select the specific genotype, the genotype that could provide the goals for productivity and also for environmental friendly way, how can we help breeders and also farmers to reach that goal. So here are all the entities that work in this project. I'm very, as I said before, I'm very honored to represent not only different companies and also universities in, this, in Brazil and other researchers that work here with me, Adriano, and other uh, colleagues that work in this project. So it was a, a very good start understanding the potential of this new technology. I'd like to say thank you. This is my name, my phone number, and thank you again for your time. Well, we have, uh, we have time for questions. So are there any questions in the audience? So the question was, uh, do you have any idea of what causes the difference in carbon distribution under these genotypes? Well, so far it was a, a very first beginning. So we are still analyzing a, a lot of data and there's a lot of potential to, to increase this work in the largest, large scale areas to understand better the effects. So far what we learned is that the genotypes provide this information. So that's what we learned so far. But definitely it's exploratory analysis and and have a, a, a bright future, and we are looking forward to extend this, this analysis. Any other questions? So I've got one as a, as a plant breeder, admittedly, of uh, temperate legumes. Uh, for us, the, the desire is to screen a large number of genotypes for the variation you're looking for. How do you do that for a really complicated trait, such as soil carbon? Uh, how many genotypes can you evaluate easily at any one time? Well, John, definitely it's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm glad that I have a team that support, <laughs> could definitely will support me, and I'll send back a, a better answer for you. Um, as an experiment, uh, I, being clear, I, I will consult, I'll be back with you in the right answer, but, but for the experiment, definitely it was a very uh, only we only could analyze six hybrids with a lot of people working. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's why I, I said two times that I'm very honored to be yeah. here. So definitely it's a very challenging to, to sample, to do carnival sample, to analyze, to have all the resources to analyze everything. Uh, but, in a, in, but in the other hand, it's a great time uh, for us and as society uh, for the first time we, ha we had the resources. So I'm very thankful that we could combine universities, entities, companies doing this work. And probably in the future we would have more opportunities to analyze more hybrids or other genotypes. Have you thought of um, maybe having other, other ways of measuring soil carbon, doing it remotely? Um, maybe some sorts of imaging that you might be able to use? Yes, yes. Uh, so, Joan, this is a very great, another great question. Uh, 
as a starting point, we saw an opportunity to analyze zero to 90 centimeters. It's very hard work, but looking for the future uh, and combining and stacking information from NDVI and other sources, we saw an opportunity to minimize the amount of work mm -hmm. and also to provide a prediction for each hybrid, the amount of carbon that they could yep. potentially stock. So definitely it's a, a, this is a potential next step for our research too, yep. specifically for Brachiara. When we analyze the Brazilian opportunity on that, we are talking about from more than 190 million hectares only in Brazil. And, yep. and, and there's a lot of opportunity to use Brachiara hybrids, not only for stored carbon, but also to, su to support growers in soil erosion and other, a lot of effects that we have, not only in Brazil, but worldwide. We have one more question. Could you, um, uh, <laughs> I on. lost the last part. Right. But I'll, hang on, I'll give you the microphone. You can perhaps, because we need to record these questions. Okay, it's in the poorer lands in Brazil, in the wetlands, like the Pantanal, people use the Brachiaria umidicula, yep. which would be the poorer Brachiaria. Would you have any numbers to compare with all these hybrids and the better Brachiarias? Does it do some sequestration in carbon? Uh, on this study, I don't have. Uh, also, Adriano, if you have any further information, uh, Adriano is the, one of the others of the project. Uh, for this project, we don't have. So this, this specific project, we combine the three uh, species uh, doing the hybridation. of the, the hybrids have the three species, but don't have this specific brachiaria type. Definitely, it's an opportunity, uh, again, like as a starting point, as the project, we see a lot of uh, opportunity to test, to understand uh, this technology and also the potential of hybrid brachiaria and lands like Pantanal in Brazil. We have time for one more. There's another question. Okay, there isn't. So thanks again. Thank you, John. Yep. Appreciate it. Let's just sign that off there. Sure. So our next speaker, I'm hoping, is just walking in the door now. Jacob is here. Jacob's here. He's the man in the. There he is. So our, our next speaker um, is Jacob Gilly. Hi, Jacob. And Dr. Andy Johnson. Uh, we're splitting this session. Yeah, I understand that. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I've got my thumb drive. Yep. You load it now. Yep. Are you speaking first? Are you? I'm speaking first. Yeah. Oh, right. Do you want me just to start? What time yep. is it? Uh, we can. We just. Um, oh, we what still is it? have five minutes. We have five minutes here. Yeah. Oh, why don't you load your talk then? You just load your, load your talk. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Ah. Good morning. How do you say? So yesterday, Tina has forgotten to include my name right. uh, in the sixteenth May. So now they have inserted, and it is told that she has incomplete the market. This is the title.
actually. I think we save this way. Would you just save it to the desktop? No. I just want to make sure when I pull my thumb drive out that it works. It's not giving the save option. I could just leave it in until afterwards. That's what I'll do. We'll be um, we'll be starting the next session in a, a couple of minutes, uh, just so that we're coordinated with the other sessions. This next uh, talk is uh, we've got two people talking, Amy and Jacob. Uh, Amy's going to go first, and then we'll have Jacob speaking. Uh, they'll speak uh, for about 25 minutes, and we'll take five minutes uh, questions at the end. We do have another talk now. Uh, starting at uh, 11.30. This was not on your program. So uh, this is by Canon Pandian. Excuse me if I've mispronounced your name. Um, talking on grass vegetation dynamics and wetlands with different utilisation. So we'll take that talk uh, at 11, uh, 11.30. We have time on the program to do that. Okay, I'll just do the introductions now, which will give uh, Amy and Jacob the full half hour. So Amy and Jacob are going to talk to us on bird-friendly beef. It's an interesting title. Um, exploring <laughs> the impacts of regenerative forage production. So Amy, over to you. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, um, I'm Amy Johnson. I'm with the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute based out of Front Royal, Virginia. And I'm here with my colleague, Jacob Gilley from American Farmland Trust. And we're gonna be co-presenting today on a project that we're working on together, Bee Friendly Beef, exploring the impacts of regenerative forage production on grassland birds. <coughs> So to start, I just wanted to give an intro as to why we're doing this. I've been working on grassland bird research and conservation over the last 10 years, and we work with farms throughout the state of Virginia, looking at how different management practices are impacting our grassland bird populations. And this is the one of the, one of the farms we work with in the plains called Kinlock Farm. And on this farm, they practice rotational grazing. And as such, we see savanna sparrow populations, more so sort of in the short grasses during the breeding season, also in the warm season grasses over winter. They leave dead snags in the middle of their pastures, so we see American kestrels nesting in the cavities. We see red-winged blackbirds nesting in what we would call weeds growing in, in the pastures that the cattle aren't eating. We also see bobwhite quail in some of the edge habitat. We actually see more than 50 species of birds in and around these pastures that Kinlock Farm is managing throughout the year, both for livestock as well as biodiversity. So why is this important from a grassland bird perspective? Our grassland birds have declined more so than any other guild of birds in North America. So more than 50% of our populations of grassland birds have just disappeared. So our species of bobolinks, these are tiny grassland birds that migrate all the way from Argentina. For every five we had in the 1970s, we only have two remaining today. We've lost 75% of our loggerhead shrikes. These are a small predatory songbird, also known as the butcher bird because they impale their prey on thorns around the farm. So you may see their leftover morsels on your barbed wire fences. And the eastern meadowlark, only one of four still exist on the landscape today, and these are such an iconic grassland bird species. So the factors that are contributing to this decline, and of course, like a lot of species that are declining, it's a whole bunch of things all at once, but free roaming cats, urban sprawl, uh, pesticide exposure, 
agricultural intensification. Um, it just keeps adding up insect decline. I'm sure you've heard about the insect, insect apocalypse. So if we're looking at how we're going to be conserving these birds, we need to understand where they exist. More than 80% of their distribution during the breeding season falls on private lands. And as such, we have to make sure that if we want to be successful in conservation, we facilitate a model that works for both birds as well as farmers. So that's where Virginia Working Landscapes comes in. We're a Smithsonian-based program, and we collaborate with local partners and farmers to conduct research just to better understand how land management is influencing our native biodiversity. And we work in a 16-county region throughout Virginia. We started with about 10 farms back in 2010, and to date we're over 300 that cover more than 80,000 acres. So we work with cattle farms. Uh, we work with farms that are just sort of left fallow post-agricultural fields, hay fields. Um, I forgot to mention before, we work mostly in grassland systems, and also fields that have been restored or converted to native wildflower meadows. And I have a lot of research to share, but I'm only going to share a little morsel um, because today we're talking about bird-friendly beef. And what's interesting about over 10 years of monitoring, as much as we're finding birds like quail and common yellowthroat and prairie warblers in these restored wildlife meadows and in fallow fields, our grassland obligates, so that eastern meadowlark I showed you earlier, those bobolinks we're finding in much higher densities in agricultural fields, so the fields that are managed for grazing and haying. Now, why is this a problem? Hay season overlaps perfectly with nesting season. So right at the peak point of hay harvest is also the peak point of birds nesting in these hay fields, and they lay their eggs directly on the ground. Also, as we're seeing intensification of grazing, we're also experiencing a lot more trampling of nests during the breeding season. So that left us with a question of how can we conserve birds, but also be working with farmers to adopt practices that work for both farms and people. And this is where Jacob comes in. This is actually Jacob's farm in Madison, Virginia. He just launched the Sustainable Grazing Initiative a few years ago in Virginia. And we got together just to talk about what our programs were doing and where there was overlap. And as we walked through the fields of his farms, I noticed there were grassland birds everywhere. And it wasn't just adults. It was babies. I mean, there was definitely an incredible system happening over there. And so we talked a little bit about what practices he was using. He taught me all about summer stockpiling. I'd never heard of that before. I'm an ornithologist. So, you know, I don't know a lot about farming. And so thanks to Jacob, um, we also brought in a couple of other farmers, and we designed the Bee Friendly Beef Project. So this is a project to explore the effects of regenerative grazing and haying, because that's also a threatening system on birds, on the reproductive success of our grassland birds. So with the help of Jacob and other producers, we identified four treatments. So we have one treatment that's grazed during peak nesting season, so between May 15th and July 15th. We have another treatment that's summer stockpiled, so the cattle can graze early when the, gr the grass growth is really strong, but then they're taken off before May 15th. That field is then rested until July 15th, and that's the peak nesting period for a lot of our grassland birds. We also have two hay treatments, so an early hay where you can get an early harvest off before June 1st, but then leave the field for about 45 to 60 days afterwards to allow the birds to try a second clutch or a delayed hay, and we compromise with the producers on this. Normally, we would say wait until July 1st, but we really wanted to find a compromise with producers, so we, we went with June 15th to see what we could find. So we had field methods. With Virginia Working Landscapes and George Mason, we've been monitoring the breeding activity um, by doing nest searching and watching behavioral observations in the field. And meanwhile, AFT has been collecting forage samples. Um, they've been collecting samples from the hay bales, and they've also been collecting samples directly from the pastures. So what we have found, and this is just from the first two years, we're about to enter our fourth year of surveying. Um, we monitored over 300 territories. We have found that the delayed hay treatment and also the summer stockpiled treatment have given us the highest reproductive success and almost comparable to fields that are never disturbed throughout the breeding season, so upwards of 70% reproductive success. But what does this mean for the producer? And Jacob will get a little more into this. But what we found is there was a loss in nutritional quality with that delayed hay date. So if we were going to make this work for farmers, we would need to figure out an incentive payment to help them along. 
However, in the stockpiled fields, we also had a really high rate of reproductive success, and it resulted in standing forage that's suitable in quality for various classes of livestock. So then the producers also had reduced reliance on hay. So as far as we are concerned, this summer stockpiling could really be a win-win for grassland birds as well as producers. So after this, we're really working with these dates to try to help inform conservation. As you can see from this graph, peak hay dates in Virginia where we work are right around June 1st. And you'll see from many of our species, that's right when the first clutches of nests are just starting to leave the nest. So if we're haying around that time, we might be fledging 0 to 20 percent of our baby birds that are nesting in fields. But if we can delay that hay, up until July 1st, now that is 30 days, we can fledge out about 80% at least of our grassland bird population. So with that, we would actually be able to sustain, if not grow, our population of declining grassland birds. So what are we doing with this data? Uh, we're working with Jacob and other partners to create educational resources that give producers an idea of when they hay and how that's going to impact the birds. And not only for producers, but any landowner that has a field with grass that they're trying to manage and may want to help improve biodiversity. And we just launched a new initiative with several other partners so that we can take this science and apply it directly to the ground. So AFT, American Farmland Trust, has been a huge part of this but we're also working with Quail Forever, who are experts in habitat restoration, and the Piedmont Environmental Council, and their focus is land preservation. And so what we're doing is putting all of our expertise together to apply this science to on-the-ground conservation action. And one of the ways we're doing it is we just launched an incentives program. Like we said, that hay quality can be reduced. It could result in a loss of finances to the producer. So we came up with the funding to pay those producers. If they can set aside their hay field until June first, or sorry, July 1st, they're getting $35 an acre. At the same time, if producers can adopt summer stockpiling, they're also getting $35 an acre. So we piloted this last year. We just got funding for another two years through National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. But just last year, from our calculations of all of our research, we know that we fledged at least 15,000 baby birds across the sites that were just enrolled in this program. But we had several farmers and landowners that didn't even enroll. They said, I don't need the funds, we just want to help. So this year we're trying to track all of the properties that did it without those financial incentives to see really what kind of impact we're having on grassland bird populations. And finally, we've recently started working with the state of Virginia. So not only are we going to be using grant money from NIFWF, but now we're going to be using state conservation funds to incentivize farmers to adopt summer stockpiling, as well as delayed haying. So this is going to go through the state level EQIP and CSP program so landowners can apply in addition to all these other conservation practices. And hopefully we'll get a lot more people participating in this bird friendly uh, production. So now I'll pass it over to Jacob to talk about this uh, from the production side. Thanks. Thank you, Amy. Uh, so, Amy, as Amy mentioned, my name is Jacob Gilly. I'm the Senior Technical Livestock and Grazing Specialist for American Farmland Trust. Uh, also based out of Virginia, uh, my wife and I own and operate a diversified livestock operation, primarily beef. Um, got four kids, and um, Amy said she didn't know much about production agriculture. Well, I didn't know anything about grassland birds four years ago, and uh, it's really been a journey uh, which I've enjoyed. Appreciate the opportunity to speak today. <clears throat> So um, in addition to grassland bird work, I also promote uh, regenerative grazing practices for producers uh, to improve water quality, soil health, um, and just ecological diversity and health uh, through several different best management practices, which you can see on the screen. Um, several of these that do improve soil and water quality are so are shown to benefit grassland birds, um, such as native warm season grass establishment, um, kestrel box installation, and then um, responsible rotational grazing. 
And so Amy mentioned previously um, about the project design, so I won't spend too much time here. Um, but American Farmland Trust's role in this is producer engagement and also um, assisting with project design to where the recommendations being put forth to promote uh, grassland bird habitat and nesting success are also conducive for producers to be profitable because certainly for these practices to be implemented on working landscapes, they need to be uh, sustainable for producers in the long run. Uh, we've done extensive forage analysis and we're going to continue to do uh, additional forage analysis because this is extremely important to make sure that we match uh, the forage quality with the uh, production needs of our livestock. We've also done extensive producer research. I sit on the Virginia Forage and Grassland Council board, also very involved with Virginia Farm Bureau. And we also have a set of producers in, in Virginia that American Farmland Trust works closely with through our uh, sustainable grazing project that we've been able to showcase and disseminate this information. So why should producers care about birds? And I think this is a, a question that a lot of uh, folks may ask themselves. As you see that we say 15,000 birds, you say, well, why should we care? And, um, and it's a good question. And from a producer perspective, I think there's increased revenue opportunities that producers can capture, whether that's through bird-friendly beef, whether that's through providing um, birding walks on operations, utilizing it on social media to um, enhance direct marketing sales. Um, also, birds are, are extremely great environmental indicators. If we see a lot of ecological diversity, a lot of different grassland birds, we can pretty much uh, determine that the health of our soils, water quality, and our operations is, is going to be good. Uh, pest control, you know, tree swallows, we can certainly put boxes on our operations and help control fly populations. And landowner relationships, so my wife and I, we lease several different uh, farms within our area. And I strategically place um, kestrel boxes outside the windows of their houses so that they see that we do care about their land and the environment. And so it helps us maintain those lease agreements uh, for the long term. And then indirect benefits um, such as soil, water quality. As we talk about grassland birds, we're talking about leaving adequate uh, residual height for the forage. Certainly, we all know, or most of us know, that if we keep the soil covered, we can help reduce erosion issues as well. And it's just our plain responsibility. So one of the um, efforts that I've made through American Farmland Trust is to increase adoption of technology on operations through the use of apps and software. And there are several different types of apps that we've worked with to include pasture map, agri-web, Maya grazing. And these tools are important because they allow uh, producers to be able to map their fields, know how many acres are in each field, be able to get an aerial observation of that with regard to uh, proximity of trees and forest and um, how wide is a field. Um, and these are all indicators that can help us identify which fields to delay hay, delay grazing, um, grassland birds due to predation don't necessarily like narrow fields or those surrounded by trees. And so we can utilize these apps to develop out grazing plans, which you can see here um, through the Pasture Map app. This is one of the farms that we work on in Rappahannock, Virginia. And um, you can see the field CR5, nine acres up in the top left. You know, that is a field that would not be um, very conducive for the grassland birds that we are mostly concerned about in Virginia. And so that would be one that you know, would be really good for native warm season grasses. That's uh, where we can send the, the cattle during the middle of the nesting season and then leave some of these more open fields uh, out there that are cool season perennials uh, for the grassland birds um, that we're most concerned about. So we, we have limited time here, but another reason that grassland birds are important is because we use them in a lot of our day-to-day -day sayings, uh, at least in the U.S. And so you may recognize some of these. And that is a metal arc uh, that I was holding. Um, so we've uh, tagged some of these uh, birds and, and looked at them um, up close and pulled samples and just find it extremely fascinating. And I think the more and more that we are in tune with what's around us and the smaller uh, that we're looking at, you know, you can go from birds, you can go to the forage, you can go to soils, microbes. The more in tune we are, uh, the more likely we are going to be sustainable for the future. 
So as mentioned, uh, another um, piece of the work that I've um, pretty much participated in was looking at the forage quality of the hay in the pasture. And um, you can see that the crude protein percent certainly did see a, a decrease of about 20% um, from 8.5 to 6.8%. Uh, and then we also saw uh, a decrease in uh, amount of energy available. And um, you can see through the livestock, um, kind of the NRC uh, nutrient recommendation tables, the um, dry brood cows, you know, these forages were, were mostly adequate uh, for a dry cow. Um, even the late cutting hay is pretty close with the exception of uh, a few points in protein. Um, but when we look at our lactating cows, and this was based on a 1300 pound, um, you know, cow in moderate uh, milk, um, that late hay is not adequate. And, and actually the early cutting hay is inadequate as well. Certainly we know that this uh, is impacted by the makeup of our forages. Um, but these were primarily grasses with uh, some clovers mixed in. But <clears throat> alternatively, if we look at our pasture, oops, our pasture quality, um, you know, between the early grays and the continuous grays, um, you know, that uh, quality maintained itself and took those that randomized uh, walking through the field, grabbed sample, watched the cattle, um, looked at what they were actually grazing, and our samples were really uh, quite, quite good and quite high for that based upon the needs of our livestock. So as mentioned earlier, you know, ways of increasing profitability on operations. Um, the Audubon uh, Society has a bird-friendly um, beef certification, and um, you know, that has primarily taken uh, adoption in the western or midwestern uh, part of the United States. Uh, at this point, they're not there on the east coast uh, with the certification. We've had some of those conversations. Uh, we're intrigued, uh, potentially working through the Smithsonian. They have a bird-friendly coffee program and trying to increase consumer awareness uh, for bird-friendly beef. And, um, you know, these are the websites of uh, Audubon certified bird-friendly beef and then Smithsonian's bird-friendly coffee. And some of the consumer research that we've looked at, um, unfortunately, uh, consumers do not have a, a huge preference at this point for bird-friendly. And I believe that's mostly because they're just unaware of the importance of grassland birds. And so continued uh, education and promotion to consumers and the general public is, is necessary to help increase adoption of bird-friendly beef. So mentioned BMPs earlier, and these are just several of the BMPs that uh, can help grassland birds on our operations. Whoops, go back. Maybe, maybe not. It's a bit of a lag. There's one picture that uh, it's not going to show up. Uh, but it was a kestrel box uh, that we were hanging on in operation. And uh, the box, you know, we put on a pole in the center of the field. And as uh, Amy mentioned, it's a small falcon. And, um, and this is actually a picture from this year. Uh, we've got cameras on poles. We can stick them up into the box, uh, look at the birds. And, and honestly, I mean, you might, these are my kids in my summer intern on our operation from last year. And I really just see um, this as generational practice adoption and, and change and through observation and awareness. Um, and we have to start, especially when they're young. Um, but if you can't look in a box and see uh, this kestrel and be in awe of life and knowing that you know, some of the practices that we're adopting are helping, um, helping this, I mean, it's something wrong with you. <laughs> um, but um, as a producer, I just, I, I get a lot of joy out of this. <clears throat> so Virginia Tech has done uh, extensive research in the Shenandoah Valley uh, with summer stockpile. And um, if you want additional information on this, uh, I'd recommend Googling it and, and going through and finding their PDF document. But um, in brief summary, uh, I'm gonna go through four different uh, pictures here. 
but you're setting aside um, about 25% of your total uh, grazable acres um, from pretty much green up, which in Virginia is about middle of April uh, until about August, and then you're continuing to rotationally graze the other 75%. Um, starting um, in mid-July, you're going to remove another 25% of that land um, and start resting that. Um, and then you'll come back and, and start grazing that after you uh, graze the summer stockpile. So then starting in mid-August, which as um, Amy mentioned, you know, the grassland birds are pretty much done um, fledgling their young. And so we can move into that 25% and strip graze the summer stockpile. And uh, through this research, they pulled a lot of forage sample analysis and did similar work to show which classes of cattle uh, it proved good for. But the point I want to make here is um, this model works, but which 25% you choose is the most critical part of this. And that's where going back to those apps and the software being able to gain an understanding of amount of acres and how that pasture lays is critical as we continue to talk to producers and provide technical assistance. So yeah, this model can work. You can integrate native warm seeds to grasses if you like. Um, but you know, again, knowing the preferences of these grassland birds, which um, typically 20 acres plus of open um, pasture land grasslands is um, is optimal. And I will say that having 20 acres on your own land plus another 50 acres across the fence on somebody else's land counts, you know, so it doesn't have to be just you're isolated. And so a lot of the work we're doing in Virginia is promoting peer-to-peer um, -peer learning and producer engagement with their neighbors. So then with the, the predominantly fescue forage that we have in Virginia, it holds its quality quite well through the winter and we can strip graze that uh, as stockpile forage. Um, and then kind of closing up, you know, all this work is extremely important, but in my opinion, and especially as a producer, we can do research, but if we don't disseminate it, uh, we're not gonna expect change, especially widespread change. And so we've worked through conferences like the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, which moves around the US each year, um, producer socials, and so I have about 15 to 18 operations in Central Virginia uh, that we have a really tight-knit group of and we have quarterly producer socials where we go around and to each other, tour each other's operations and um, get to be able to kind of just spread what's happening, what's good, what's bad on our operations and I think all of us can can have these types of socials happening in our communities. Um, went to the Folklife Festival in Washington DC this past year and I was a bit out of my element, even though I, I live an hour and 45 minutes, depending on traffic, could be three hours, uh, south of DC. Uh, it was nice to get up there and have some of those conversations because a lot of times livestock production gets a bad rap when we start talking about climate change um, and other things. And so being able to talk directly with consumers and say, no, if we do this in the right ways, we can sequester carbon, we can help grassland birds, we can have ecological diversity. And then uh, we just recently hosted a workshop um, through uh, the Virginia Forge and Grassland Council and uh, NCAT, Soul for Water, uh, down the Shenandoah Valley. And we were able to hang up the Kestrel box. We were able to, um, Amy gave a presentation on this very similar research and it was well received by producers. Most of them, um, you know, I would say maybe weren't aware. And now that they are, they're a lot more in tune. And, and the birds showed favor because we had a Kestrel fly over as soon as we hung the box. So it couldn't have been better timing. But I am at time, and I appreciate y'all coming and listening to us today. Thanks, thanks, Jacob and Amy. That's perfect timing. Um, made my job very easy. So thanks very much. Uh, we've got uh, a few minutes for questions. Do we have any questions? Amy and Jacob, maybe you could stand up there, and I'll need you to speak. In yeah, what is your plant species composition in your uh, pastures? Uh, curious, just based upon the timing that, that you're uh, doing your different management activities. So with regard to plant species diversity, um, unfortunately, uh, in Virginia, mostly fescue grasses. We do have some orchard grass coming in. Um, some of the operations we have have some brome, um, 
a lot of white clover, um, and then some forbs coming in too, chicory and um, yeah, plantain, um, those types of things, but predominantly grass forages. For this specific research project, we're focusing in cool season grass pastures. So, so do you find on your fescue pastures the type of endophyte you've got on that fescue has an impact? Uh, in New Zealand, we've actually developed a, uh, a grass, uh, both in ryegrass and fescue, which deters birds around airports uh, by having a very toxic endophyte in it that stops insects and also rodents and whatever else. Uh, do you find that if you use the Kentucky 31 endophyte, you get less birds than if you use one that's a, one of the novel endophytes? Or have you tried that? I could talk to you about that later. We haven't, <laughs> I, we haven't seen the research or, or done the research, but maybe our birds just know where the pharmacy is to get some medicine. And, and I'm talking a little bit congested because yesterday I was a mess. I went checking our fence lines and yeah, toxic fescue tears me up uh, during reproductive phase. And yesterday I was like... Yeah, we, oh. ha we have the solution for you. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Do you anticipate that private landowners who are not producers but perhaps have lands that would be conducive to having grazing introduced would be open to this? And what, how significant would those acreages be for this program? Yeah, I would say it would be significant, especially in, um, well, a lot of areas in Virginia, folks will utilize uh, open lands for hay to keep it looking nice and to keep it under um, tax land use. Um, if it's in productive agriculture in Virginia, uh, most counties will have um, kind of a, a property tax decrease. Um, but, you know, a lot of landowners, I think, do care about grassland birds and, and the environment. And so it's just making them aware. And we've had produce or landowners that have asked their producers, hey, can you delay your hang? And, and oftentimes, um, what we've seen, producers can't make it to all their hay in time anyway. And so um, by them getting an incentive payment, it's kind of icing on the cake um, as well. But yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of times where the landowner is gonna ask the producer to adopt their practices and can work from both directions. I think we've unfortunately just run out of time. So thanks again, Amy and Jacob, really appreciate that. Join me and thank both of them, thank you. <clears throat> So we're now moving to the last talk, which was not on the program. This is new. Maybe if you could load your um, presentation, it would be useful. So this talk is additional to the program that you have. It's by Kenan Pandian, and who's going to talk to us about um, grass vegetation dynamics and wetlands with different utilisation. So he just needs to load his presentation and then we'll go for the next uh, 10 minutes, quarter of an hour. Thank you. Just a minute. Sorry, it's not, a, if this is, this is not in, the, not in the program. This is an additional talk that I've just been informed is going to be given. Does you have the name of the talk? Yep, the name of the talk is Grass Vegetation Dynamics and Wetlands with Different Utilisation. Are you having trouble loading it, are you? I think it, I think it's that one there. Just up a bit. That's it. Oh, yes. yep. <laughs> Just a A brief introduction about me and my institute. I am Dr. Kanan from Madurai, India, the southern part of India, where we have the work on the grassland ecology 
on various aspects. As this work specifically comes under the project funded by Ministry of Environment Forests, we have the different wetlands to work on it, uh, to study about the ecology and the hydrological phenomenon, the water quality, and the aviation, uh, avian population, and the vegetation dynamics, and so on. So to interact with all the other environmental as well as the biotic uh, factors, the very good example just portrayed by the previous speakers about the proto-cooperation, the same mechanism what we find in our present is. Let me to start. So how to bring this? Uh, Okay. So cancel Would button. You like help? No, please. So I'll just cancel that out. And then we'll okay. start the slideshow. There you okay. go. Thanks. So we have the different kind of uh, wetlands in India, especially in um, Tamil Nadu. Uh, the uh, wetlands, in terms of uh, the dry ponds or the ephemeral ponds or the temporary ponds we have, it has a very uh, unique uh, ecological conditions where the alternate dry as well as wet periods they have inundated with the water during the monsoon rains and yeah, with a brief period, and now following that, the dry ponds. And in another side, the uh, permanent uh, lakes, as well as river streams, mountain streams, are at one side. So we want to compare these both, how the wetlands behave on its, um, the biodiversity and the vegetation, together and what kind of interactions, especially with the biotic as well as the anthropogenic uh, interactions. So these studies give a clear picture about uh, the further emphasis of the previous workers, especially the grass diversity and the uh, grass diversity pattern and its productivity is basically lying upon various uh, phenomenal futures, especially we would like to concentrate upon the critical ecosystem functions and the evenness of grass community. The evenness of grass community here I'm talking about is the evenness never behaves uh, similar functions uh, in which we, our results uh, strongly claims that. But in some of the works they have shown that the evenness when it is uh, great we don't have the, uh, uh, the productivity. And another future is the environment and land use pattern change makes the community change. Very good evidence uh, by the previous speakers. Uh, um, in a round of uh, season, we got 15,000 birds populated in this protocol operation. That's a fantastic. A similar point with a different kind of data, we have this evidence. And the richness and evenness disentangles the mechanism whereby uh, for each and every landscape and every habitat and every season and every point of our experimental area, we need to understand the mechanism of the evenness as well as the richness index because it never goes hand in hand as we think about. So the grass diversity analysis we have made in this uh, two different uh, wetland system, one is the perennial mountain streams and the temporary ponds of the protective uh, sites. Uh, to understand the vegetation dynamics and from the overall vegetation, how the grass 
uh, biomass as well as the grass species, their pattern changes uh, during the different kind of seasons. These are the two experimental sites we uh, had. One is the ephemeral ponds that is lying in the Sivanga district of uh, Tamil Nadu, the southern part of India. It's a very dry tract where uh, the Vetangudi bird sanctuary ponds is located. It's a very small pond and three adjacent ponds are located very close to each other but their biotic interaction is different. With the community living in that area, they uh, sacrifice their uh, celebrations by not cracking the, uh, playing with the crackers during Diwali and other celebrations to keep the bird's diversity as such. The visiting birds to this pond is from uh, Australia and Europe and many other countries. The, around uh, 20,000 birds is being populated, we have recorded, at, at one year. So the season of this ponds inundated with water is between uh, November and February, usually. And at the other side, the mountain streams we had for this experiment is from, uh, on the way to Kodaikanal, we have uh, these uh, Pambar and Thalayar streams. It's a beautiful stream uh, that is also coming under the protected site. Luckily, uh, it's a very difficult place to reach by the community, so it is somewhat fairly protected. So we want to uh, make these two uh, experimental sites for our uh, study. And we have various uh, parameters uh, we have collected the soil quality, the water quality, and the substratum uh, quality of the dry ponds. Uh, one good important point here I, I would like to mention in the temporary ponds, we have a lot of data to collect. So we have two different points. One is the inundated uh, substratum. When it is desiccated, we have the different kind of vegetation. And over the buns, the raised buns of the temporary ponds, it is the uh, a, a different kind of vegetation that follows there. And over the riparian systems, we have uh, the tremendous vegetation that also the fluvial system uh, that uh, forms in the riparian system that makes all the nutrients to come towards the uh, flowing river to the downstream so that at the banks of the riparian, we have a different kind of uh, soil environment. So we had the usual practice of uh, applying the methods of line tra transects in the riparian system and the quarters, uh, 12 quarters in each point at the desiccate surface of the temporary ponds as well as on the uh, elevated buns, the raised buns. And then uh, we have selected some of the uh, specific sites at the riparian system. It goes on uh, 100 miles, the, the entire uh, downstream of the Thalayar and Pombar stream. However, we could pick out uh, some of the hydrological point of importance as well as the uh, biotic interactions. So we had the samples and the randomly collected samples from the two, uh, two streams, uh, two wetlands, and then we have analyzed the data. And from this entire uh, vegetation analysis, we have concentrated only on the grass vegetation and is being presented in this uh, talk. And the biodiversity index, the richness index, as well as the similarity coefficient by Sorensen has been pointed out. I would like to highlight only the, uh, this result. Uh, the acronyms given is PKPTY, is Periya Kollukudi Patti, and DS is Desiccate Surface, and uh, RB is the Raised Buns. Likewise, CKPTY, VK, 
PT, uh, VTDG, these are all the other two ponds adjacent to the PKPTY. And PS and uh, TS are the mountain streams, Pambar stream and Thalayar stream. See, the richness index is dwindling, the values are dwindling, as well as the Sorensen similarity index is also dwindling. We have wondered uh, why the similar pattern is not being adopted in this. Uh, later, we could uh, relate with other data of the soil parameters and the water quality. We could say that uh, in the Periyakullukudi Patti pond, where the birds are larger in numbers, the biotic interaction of the uh, biotic interaction causes the water quality with a lot of nutrients and, uh, uh, and a specific kind of eutrophication occurs. And the sedimented uh, surface supports a lot of uh, vegetation. And then there, the dilution factor is very less in that particular desiccate pond surface, as well as the edge of the pond is uh, highly disturbed than uh, the rest of the areas in the experimental areas I have shown. So these are all the interactions, but the biotic interactions as well as the anthropogenic uh, interactions cause these kind of uh, variations occur, occurring in the similarity index as well as the evenness. That greatly hits the population of the vegetation, especially the grass. And in the Pambar and Thalaya stream, this is much balanced, so that the biomass as well as the uh, total richness index has been maintained by the uh, ecosystem itself. So I wish to conclude in this way the, the wider ecological amplitude of grasses that requires the grass community aggregation uh, that is being deferred in every individual habitat, every individual niche. So we need to analyze all these kind of niches. And higher rich, richness community of streams that shows the uh, biotic interaction, the balanced biotic interactions as well as uh, the no much disturbance. And more knowledge has to be gained uh, from such kind of uh, studies. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. This is the last uh, talk of this session this morning. So uh, we'll engage in a question if uh, anyone has one. Oh, we've got any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I also ask a uh, question to uh, Jacob and uh, Sorry? Emmy. Yeah. I have a question to them. Ah, you have a question to them. You go for it. <laughs> uh, to compensate uh, the questions <laughs> to me, yeah. I just ask them. Thank you for your excellent uh, work and presentation. I uh, have you encountered any of the problems related to the uh, hay, the delayed hay, uh, especially the diseases encountered in the hay, and any summer fire? Um, okay. Um, so the first question was about just the reduction in quality of the hay. Um, I guess I'll leave that up to Jacob, but as far as summer fires, we don't get a lot of those in Virginia. Um, it, our hay fields are so green, <laughs> and our summer fires are mostly focused in the forest. Now, some folks will do prescribed burns in the summer, but it's pretty rare to do it then. Most of those occur in the winter, so January through March um, is the most common time for the pres prescribed fires in our grasslands. Can we generalize uh, this uh, out of danger is in every habitat? Pardon me? Uh, you have not encountered any fire on the grasses at your Virginia. 
uh, how we can co uh, compromise the other uh, communities in this area. So we can devise some of the methodologies specifically for their uh, point of uh, uh, where they are living. So we can do that. Yeah. Excellent. Thank well, you. We have, um, we, we have a lot of organizations in the area that work with landowners to promote prescribed fire because I think a lot of landowners are scared of fire oh. um, and especially in, in grasslands and, and how, they, how it can get away on you. So there are groups that come around and do prescribed fires and we're trying to promote more of that because we have found, especially in our native warm season grasses, that that's really one of the best management tools for those. I don't see a lot of prescribed fires happening on cool season Kansas. fields. But I oh, Kansas. I can yeah. speak to that a little bit. I'm Margit Kaltenegger from Kansas State University Research and Extension. And in Kansas, where there's the uh, common use of fire in managing the C4 grasses, what they're seeing for the uh, effect on the birdland, uh, grassland bird populations is that by having patch burning is taking only sections of the rangeland where they will rotate the fire into different areas in order to allow the grassland birds to complete their nesting season and so that they'll have the blocks of grass where they, they leave the grass to grow and then burn only certain areas in the springtime. That helps greatly in protecting our grassland birds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. We'll be, uh, we'll be back here uh, at 1.30.